Sicily, birthplace of the mafia, where the mob is fighting the law, winning, and growing bolder. The mafia in America, its bosses are being jailed. But is the mafia here really on the ropes? As fast as we're prosecuting them, they're actually making more members than we're prosecuting. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from New York, Forrest Sawyer. It could have been fairly argued that Giovanni Falcone, an Italian judge and former prosecutor, knew more about the mafia than any law enforcement official in the world. He put hundreds of mobsters behind bars and was tracing connections among the Italian mafia and gangsters in Colombia and the U.S. I say was tracing because Falcone, his wife, and three guards were all killed a few weeks ago, blown up as they were driving a coastal highway. It was a sign that for all the legal assaults, for all the mafia bosses thrown in jail, organized crime is still alive and well. In fact, there's reason to believe the multi-billion dollar world of drug trafficking has forged powerful new links in a crime chain that stretches around the world and into our own backyard. The murder of one courageous prosecutor was, in fact, a personal message of intimidation. In Sicily, on a tree outside Giovanni's Falcone's home, a schoolboy left his own message. The way you died, the boy wrote on a note pinned to the tree, so too will the mafia die. That will take some doing. We begin tonight where the mafia itself began, in Sicily, with correspondent Jim Laurie. It is an island possessed of rural beauty and deceptive tranquility. For Sicily, for generations, has been home base to one of the world's most violent criminal organizations. It is leaving an increasingly sickening legacy. In the past 10 years, the Mafia has carried out hits on nearly 20 Italian law enforcement officials. The latest, Giovanni Falcone, Italy's number one Mafia fighter who was murdered in May when his bulletproof car was blown up by remote-controlled explosives on a highway outside the capital of Palermo. I think Sicilian Mafia has become stronger, for it has become an integral part of organized crime on a global scale. The tentacles of the octopus, as it's known here, still control or extort from most business in Palermo. They also now control virtually all the heroin and cocaine traffic in Europe. But today, once fearful, now angry, Sicilians are beginning to fight back. We want to fight uh, the Mafia with more strength than, than in, the past, in the past time. The fight begins in the schools. No! Father Don Paolo Totoro teaches eight-year-olds Mafia awareness. What do the Mafia do wrong, Father Tutoro asks. They kill and sell drugs, this little girl answers. The hope is to break the cycle of fear and silence, omerta, which has surrounded the Mafia and protected it here for generations. Father Tutoro asks children to draw their feelings about the Mafia, a child's world of kidnappings and murder. Encouraged to report Mafia crime and shun violence, the lecture ends with the symbolic breaking of a toy gun. Adults are beginning to act too. At this political meeting in Palermo, people demand stronger laws and better government to fight the Mafia. Their leader and head of a new anti-mafia political party, which did well in recent elections, is Leo Luca Orlando, former Palermo mayor. Surrounded 24 hours a day by armed guards, Orlando says the mafia's grip on politics is being gradually loosened. If we will be able to defeat the old politics, if we will be able to defeat the politics that protects the mafia, uh, probably we will be uh, saved. But if there is progress in Palermo, there is caution in Corleone. This little town was made famous in the Godfather films and is the real life home to no less than three mafia families. Few here, though, will speak against them. No lo so. 
I don't know anything about mafiosi. We don't see them, we don't know them. What is the mafia? The mafia doesn't exist. It's all made up. We're all good people here. Whatever the progress in breaking down the wall of omerta or silence, the mafiosi continue to prosper. Sicilian prosecutors tell us there are at least 30 families with several thousand members who continue to run a network extending from little towns like Corleone to Palermo and beyond to Bangkok, Cairo and New York. Recruits for their international operations are found here in the back streets of Palermo and other Sicilian towns. For most of this century, important links to America's La Cosa Nostra were forged here. The American and Sicilian Mafia operations have usually been kept independent. But before his death, Judge Falcone, according to Italy's Justice Minister, was investigating ongoing illegal immigration of mafiosi to America. What he told us uh, is that uh, uh, La Cosa Nostra, uh, uh, wishing to uh, enforce the organization in the U.S., uh, uh, recruited uh, new uh, mafiosi so-called Picciotti from uh, neighbors of Palermo and other Sicilian towns uh, to Philadelphia uh, family uh, to uh, strengthen the organization of La Cosa Nostra. The recruits may help explain why, despite celebrated convictions, mafia power in America has not been entirely broken. They're what they call making or inducting new members as, as they go on. As fast as we're prosecuting them, they're actually making more members than we're prosecuting. So we're a long ways from solving the La Cosa Nostra problem in the United States. Besides trying to expand U.S. operations, mafiosi are also finding fertile ground for new business in the once closed areas of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And before his death, Falcone was probing a further alarming sign of mafia growth, the link between Sicily and the Colombian cocaine cartels. For 10 years, author Claire Sterling has researched the international operations of the Sicilian families. They actually sent an emissary from Palermo to Aruba, to the island of Aruba, to negotiate with representatives of the Medellin cartel with a proposal that because heroin sold for much more in America than in Europe and cocaine sold for much more in Europe than America, that the mafia would do a swap with the Colombians. The result is that while heroin sales in Europe have stabilized, cocaine sales have dramatically increased. Cocaine use here up more than 10 times since the mid-1980s. For Sicily's mafia, business has never been better. They control the distribution network for one of the world's most lucrative trades. The price for a gram of cocaine on the streets of Europe is three times that in New York. At the funeral of Judge Falcone, emotions were strong. The citizens of Sicily were outraged. The Italian government began enacting new laws. The American FBI joined the murder probe. Still, the tentacles of the octopus continue to spread. This is Jim Laurie for Nightline in Palermo. One critical question, what do the fortunes of the Sicilian Mafia mean for their American counterparts? When we come back, we'll be joined by two experts on organized crime, the FBI's chief of criminal investigations, and the writer whose book was the basis for the movie Goodfellas. Larry Potts is assistant director of the FBI and the chief of its criminal investigations division, which spearheads the effort against the American mafia, also known as La Cosa Nostra. Mr. Potts joins us from our Washington bureau. Nicholas Pileggi, a contributing editor at New York Magazine, has been writing about organized crime for more than 30 years. His book, Wise Guy, about mob informer Henry Hill, was made into the movie Goodfellas. Mr. Pileggi joins us from KOMO-TV in Seattle. Mr. Ponce, the headlines here in the United States have been about the successes of law enforcement. John Gotti, head of the Gambino family, in jail for life. Other busts, other convictions. It would appear that here in the United States, the mob is more or less on the run. Quite a different picture in Sicily. Are things so very different? Well, I, I think things uh, certainly are somewhat different. We have had tremendous successes against the, the mafia, the La Cosa Nostra here in the United States. We've convicted 23 bosses. We have been able to actually uh, get a microphone in a 
a room where they were having an induction ceremony in the New England family. We've uh, convicted the entire commission, uh, the ruling uh, group of uh, LCN leaders, the Cosa Nostra leaders in New York. We've had tremendous successes, and while they may be on the run, uh, they're far from, from on the ropes. So we have a long way to go. Well, in Sicily, to be fair, hundreds of, of mobsters were put into prison by, by Mr. Falcone, and still they are saying that, it, that it's very healthy. In your assessment, is the structure still in place for the mob here in the United States? Oh, I think the structure is still very much in place. We have determined that you, from, from past experience, that you can't just take out leaders and expect us to be successful and not have the LCN continue to operate. You have to take not only the leadership, but the soldiers and convict them. You have to take away the economic underpinnings. You have to take away their assets. Mr. You... Pelleggi, explain to me what's happening here. If you cut off the head of this beast, why doesn't the body die? Why, does it, uh, why is it able to transform itself and keep growing? Well, one of the uh, points about organized crime, and the FBI's effort has been extraordinary in uh, putting them down over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. But the, the key to the mob's power is the fact that it has influence in the infrastructure of certain businesses. And as long as that power in those businesses exists, you're going to find that they're still a very powerful force. And I think that is the next step that the, uh, the FBI is going after. How powerful are they now as compared to, let us say, 10, 15, 20 years ago? Well, they're, um, uh, they're not as powerful. I, my feeling is that they were the most powerful, the most powerful in the 50s. Uh, they had come through a 50-year period where most people didn't know they existed. Uh, and uh, at that point, you've got to remember, you had uh, mob bosses calling mayors of cities. You had uh, mob influence on a political level that would be unthinkable happily today. Uh, and I think since then, there's been a constant erosion of power on their part. Uh, but it's still uh, enormously powerful. Mr. Potts, the, the way that we were hearing about Sicily is in our piece from Jim Laurie, there is a sense that Sicily really is the center of power for, for the Italian mob. Is there a close connection between the American mafia and, uh, and the Italian mafia? Oh, there is a very close connection. Historically, uh, that's the beginnings of our La Cosa Nostra in Sicily. And there are such strong connections now that we have people who leave the Sicilian mafia come to the United States and actually take up positions of leadership within the La Cosa Nostra here. Are they running things from Italy or are they running things from the United States or are they separate organizations? Well, I think they're separate organizations. They're uh, maybe separate divisions of a rather large organization, but we uh, clearly have La Cosa Nostra allowing Sicilian Mafia to operate in certain sections here in the United States. And we have Sicilian Mafia actually taking part in leadership in certain families within the United States. Do you see that, Mr. Pelleggi, or are they coming in at a lower level? Are they, are they really sort of uh, street guys? No, I think, uh, I think uh, well, Larry is the expert. I think he's absolutely right. They are uh, coming in, and they've been coming in since the early 60s, believe it or not. Uh, in America, the American-born uh, wise guys are quite, quite frightened of the, uh, the Sicilian-born. Uh, and in fact, they have a derisive term for them here. They call them zips. And you, they keep coming up on the tapes. You see that the Sicilian-born guys are a little more deadly and, and uh, are really pretty terrifying, even to the uh, LCN guys born in the United States. It is still true that to be, uh, help me with this, uh, Nick, to be a made member of the Mafia, you, you have to be pure Italian? Well, I believe that's true. Yes. That's correct. And they are drawing these people from Italy into the United States, Mr. Potts, because you have managed to weaken them so much here? Well, I, I think that there has always been an exchange. And uh, I think that probably uh, the fact that we have uh, had some measure of success may contribute to that. But there's a significant heroin market here. Yeah. And where there's a significant heroin market, you're going to find the Sicilian Mafia. All right, that's a terrific place for us to stop. When I come back, I would like to talk about the role of organized crime and the mafia in drug smuggling and how they are setting up a worldwide network, network when we return in just a moment. The topic is the power of the mafia. With us is Larry Potts of the FBI and writer Nicholas Pelleggi. Mr. Potts, it is said that uh, Italian Judge 
Giovanni Falcone was investigating connections between the Colombian cartel and, and the mafia and growing links of a worldwide uh, smuggling network. Help me understand what was happening and what has been happening over these past uh, years and months. Well, I think it's very clear that the Sicilian Mafia has uh, very strong connections to the Colombian cartels. They have a the Sicilian Mafia actually has a family headquarters in, headquartered in Caracas, Venezuela, uh, right across the border from Colombia. Venezuela, a major transshipment center. And the Sicilian Mafia has, is a significant player, maybe the most significant player in Europe in terms of drug distribution. Now, are they involved in a kind of swap heroin for cocaine? Uh, yes, they are. How does that work? Well, I, I think that, that first of all, you have to realize that, that heroin is on the increase here. So there's, a, there's an increased demand for, for heroin in this country, and Sicilian Mafia has clearly been able to furnish that. And with the new information that the Colombian cartels may now be involved and are definitely now involved in the production of, of poppies, we now know that they're going to be involved in, in, in heroin production and distribution also. Then there's a tremendous demand for cocaine in Europe. So through Colombia, through the United States, this cocaine is then shipped to Europe. So essentially we have two families where, where, where the mafia has been able to control the distribution of heroin, the Colombians have been able to control the distribution of cocaine, and they that's come correct. together and make a swap in areas where it's more expensive? Yes, sir, that's correct. And how much more money is this making for each of them? An, an enormous amount, I would guess. Enormous amount, billions of dollars. And this makes them how much more powerful in your estimation? Well, money is uh, power. It, it's able to, uh, to buy them uh, the kind of uh, public officials uh, in, in various countries to uh, allow them to operate with, without uh, concern of, of being arrested or prosecuted. It uh, allows them to uh, pretty much uh, do what they please in certain areas. But Mr. Pelagi, what you hear often in the United States is that the this control and sale of drugs is really in the hands of Colombians or Jamaicans or Cubans and that the mafia has has been somewhere down the line and has been sort of displaced by these other kinds of organized crime groups. I, is that not true? No, I don't think it is true. I think uh, that while the United States has lots of different ethnic groups involved in, uh, in the distribution of uh, narcotics, uh, the traditional LCN or Sicilian Mafia guys have been involved in it for many, many years, and they continue uh, to be involved. Uh, it's very strong. They have the traditional uh, smuggling routes. They go back 100 years, and, they, and they have, uh, they've maintained that strength. So what is the relationship among these various organized crime groups? Are they in competition, or are they in, in cooperation, or both? Quite often they're in cooperation, and quite often they're uh, isolated from each other. And uh, once in a while, they, uh, they have disputes. None you know, of this stuff is, uh, is orchestrated along uh, organizational charts, as you might think of IBM or a major corporation. It's very ad hoc, and it's out there on the street. And, but and know, it's all based on greed, the, the, the desire <laughs> right. to make the buck. That, that's, that's what right. the bottom line is here. That's right. I'll tell you where I get stuck, Mr. Potts. When, when I hear about the extraordinary successes that have been made by the FBI and by law enforcement in the United States and, and by, by Mr. Falcone as well, yes. putting people in jail, and then you tell me they're still as powerful. They are aligning themselves with the Colombian cartel. They are That's forging right. worldwide networks. It sounds as though you're really swimming upstream. Well, sometimes I believe that we are, but we're making some successes by being able to use a statute that allows us not only to put them in jail for significant periods of time, and as you know, the commission members were each sentenced to 100 years in prison. Uh, not only can we put them in jail for significant periods of time, but we also need to take and have been taking their assets away from them and also take away their power base. If, they're, if they are paying public officials, then we need to go after those public officials. If they are corrupting a labor union, then we need to prevent them from doing that and enjoin them and prevent them from having that kind of influence over the labor union. And as you know, this last December, uh, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters had its first real free election in modern history, free of LCN, La Cosa Nostra, influence. Mr. Pelleggi, what you have been describing tonight, what Mr. Ponce has been describing tonight, is a kind of international coalition of organized crime. Is it fair to put it that way? Sure. You could say that. I, against that, would you not need real international cooperation among law enforcement? I think you do. And I think uh, 
what we're looking at, I, I feel, is we're just looking at the beginning of the battle. Uh, the battle is about to begin. Uh, you have uh, everyone pretty, pretty much engaged. You have the laws that have finally caught up with the crimes. And you are beginning to find cooperation between various law enforcement agencies, not only between the United States and foreign countries, but within the United States itself. Uh, there's been a traditional rivalry uh, for many years, and, and to a great degree, that's behind us. So uh, while I understand that a lot of people feel that it's a long road, I think we're beginning to move in a very solid way. You know, that sounds terrific, uh, Mr. Poss, but I, I remember what Mr. Falcone said at one point. He said it wasn't so much the mafia that had him worried, it was the uh, politicians who had been bought off. Well, I think that's right. You, you have to take away their power base, and if you have corruption, if you have law enforcement corruption, judicial corruption, uh, public any type of public official corruption, that has to be a part of the overall game plan. They have to be taken out. They also have to be convicted. Do you have the kind of optimism that, that says that we could actually get to a day where organized crime is not going to be this powerful, or are we looking at something like the drug war, which has been with us for so long and has done so little to stop the flow of drugs? No, I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic that we will come to a point where we are, I don't know whether we're able to say that we, we're able to, to declare complete victory, but I, I believe that I'm very optimistic that we will significantly deplete the power of the La Cosa Nostra here in the United States. Larry Potts, Nicholas Pelleggi, I want to thank you both for talking with us tonight. Thank you.